Hello, my friends. Today is a good day. We are going to be talking all about a man with bold ambitions, but yet wobbly funding. A story about an American supercar that would have rivaled the Ferraris and Lamborghinis of the day. A story that will leave you wondering how much substance was behind the hype. And if you haven't already guessed it, we are going to be talking all about Jerry Weigert and Vector Aeromotive. So, let's do it. <laughs> unfamiliar with this channel welcome my hobby is automotive history and if that's your cup of tea press subscribe and if not that's fine too and now we begin our story so who exactly is Jerry Weigert Gerald Alden Weigert aka Jerry was an American businessman and a automotive engineer as a youth he was highly interested in aerospace and automotives and homeboy had the aptitude for it he got a full scholarship to college studying engineering after college jerry goes off and spends a little time working for each of the big three ford general motors and chrysler then he decides you know what heck to all this i'm gonna build my own car company and i'm gonna make an american supercar with this endeavor he was going to be one of the first stateside attempts to compete with all of those European performance cars. I will say this, just a little side note, in 1970, AMC had already done their whole thing on the AMX3, which I have a video, I'll put the link down below, fascinating. Could That would have been America's first mid-engine supercar. And beautiful. Anyways, AMX3, if it had actually not had the plug pulled and it went to production in 1971, it would have been the first American supercar. All right, so it's 1971, and Jerry has teamed up with auto body expert Lee Brown to create Vehicle Design Force in Wilmington, California. If you put force on the end of anything, does it make it sound that much more awesome? The pair, with their newly found company, plan to create the American supercar, the Vector. And pre-production literature of the Vector wasn't playing. It was touting to have a dual overhead cam Porsche power plant. That's right, I say Porsche, not Porsche. Comment about it. And the price tag of the Vector was going to be $100,000. At this time in 1971, the Mura is out and it's only $21,000. God bless. That's a big price gap. Now this first car, it made its rounds. It was featured in Motor Trend in 1972. It did all of the LA Auto Shows in 1976. But everything would come to a bit of a halt when Lee Brown would decide to leave the company in 1977. So the Vector would never actually make production. Lee Brown would leave the team. And during all this commotion, Jerry Weiger decided to change the company to Vector Aeromotive. Name change is done. Vector Aeromotive is sounding good. Jerry is now focusing all of his efforts on the new concept, W2. The aggressively designed Vector W2 makes its debut in 1978. Now, at the time of the show, it was immobile. That's not really any kind of, that happens you know, with concept cars. But this car would end up running and be driven over 100,000 miles, making it possibly the most driven concept car ever. Now, Jerry was a hype man, and he was touting this W2 capable of reaching 230 miles per hour. Now, at some point, Motor Trend and Top Gear got their hands on the car to do some extensive testing. However, they were strictly prohibited from trying any top speeds. Claiming top speeds, but then not demonstrating them would kind of be a little bit of a habit for Jerry. Now we fast forward a little bit. It's 1989 and the evolution of the W2, of the Vector W2 is ready for production. It's the W8. You know how in the intro I mentioned that the funding of this car was at times a little bit interesting. Well, how the W8 was funded in this instance was public stock offerings, but also some pretty profitable trademark infringement lawsuits that Jerry initiated against Goodyear Tire and Vantage Cigarettes. 
It is said that these infringement lawsuits are primarily what kind of started the funding of Jerry's supercar dreams. Two W8 prototypes were constructed. The only one would run. For these two prototypes, the team implemented an automatic Oldsmobile TM425 transaxle paired with a twin turbo Can-Am small block Chevy V8. Modified small block Chevy V8. Now, vectors were hand built. It was a lengthy and timely process that in took testing and calibrating. If you were gonna buy one at this time, you needed to have a little bit of patience. Unfortunately for Jerry and Vector, there was an incredibly impatient tennis player that wanted to buy a W8. Andre Agassi put down his money and wanted his Vector immediately. Like he literally said, give me this car before it's ready. All right, Vector Aeromotive said, hey, this isn't a good idea. But then they folded. They told Andre that they'll deliver the car, but he could not drive it as it was not ready yet. He could only display it. So the car is not ready to drive. What does Andre do? He drives it. It breaks down. He demands all of the $455,000 that he paid for this car be refunded. And he gives the car back. And of course, all this hubbub resulted in very bad publicity for Vector Aeromotive. Now, this is not the same situation, but it's a similar PR problem. It reminds me of Michael Schumacher and his EB110, his brand new Bugatti EB110, signal yellow, all this stuff. He gets into an accident with it and he blames it on Bugatti, his Bugatti EB110 having shoddy brakes. And that wasn't good for Bugatti. A total of 17 of the Vector W8s were finished. That also includes Andre's after it got fixed up and then sold. The car did have a little bit of a cinema splash appearing in 1993 movie, Rising Sun, starring Sean Connery and Wesley Snipes. In the 90s, that's how you know you made it as a supercar company. If your car is featured in a film, with Wesley Snipes and Sean Connery. Now it is 1992. Jerry and Vector Aeromotive have released the WX3 at the Geneva Auto Show. It's essentially an evolution of the W8. Only two of the WX3s would be created, a coupe and a roadster. With the WX3, it was said that you would have three engine options. You would have a 600 horsepower V8, an 800 horsepower tuned option, and a 1200 horsepower twin turbo. It was right around this time that things started to get a little bit messy. Okay, so there's this Indonesian company called Megatech that gains controlling power of Vector Aeromotive. Jerry would come back from the Geneva Auto Show and be told that he can either step down completely or step down and just perform as the role of a designer at the company that he founded. Megatech and the board of directors were basically like, well, maybe we'll let you stay on at the company that you founded, but just as an employee. Side note, this is interesting. Megatech at this time also owned Automobili Lamborghini. Now, Jerry Weiger was a little bit of a character, okay? He told the board of directors and Megatech that, you know what, let me think about it for a few days. And then he went on to change all the locks at the headquarters and hire security guards to prevent the board of directors from showing up on Monday. Like Jerry literally locked down headquarters of Vector Aeromotive and refused to let anybody from Megatech or his board of directors onto the property. And when they called police or the authorities, Jerry just said that he had fired all them and that he didn't know why they were showing up. <laughs> were Jerry's antics absolutely amusing? Yes, but did they work? No, he would be pushed out by Megatech and Megatech would then move the company from California to share office space with Lamborghini in Florida. And did the abrupt dismissal of the founder put any kind of brakes on the company? No, immediately Vector Aeromotive went to work on the M12, which was an evolution of the WX3, but this time powered by a Lamborghini V12. 
Lamborghini Diablo V12. They took two examples of the M12 to the 1996 North American International Auto Show in Detroit, and they thought they were about to be rolling in the dough. But the sales just weren't coming in as they had expected for their Vector M12, which cost about $189,000. Now, they put, a, they put a halt to the M12 immediately when it had projected sales, but I'm also kind of wondering if maybe something else was going on in the finance department. And I'll get to that in just a second. But Megatech would sell Lamborghini to Audi in 1999 to try and raise some funds. Only 14 of the Vector M12s were ever produced. And at some times during production, Lamborghini would not fulfill their orders of engines because Vector couldn't pay for them. Now, it was rumored that Megatech's principal, Tommy Suhoro, who at the time was the son of the president of Indonesia, well, it was said that Tommy was embezzling company's funds for his own gains. Vector was not done there, and they tried to pull a supercar Hail Mary. They dropped the price, they renamed the M12 to the SVR8, and they subbed a GM LT1 engine. This didn't save the company, and they only produced one of the SVR8s. And the company just kind of started to crumble. But you know who was there waiting? to pick up those crumbs. Harry Weigert, you know he was ready to buy back his own company? And he did just that. Jerry buys back what's left of his company and he changed the name once again. So I'm gonna be honest, I omitted a couple of name changes that happened throughout this time that I didn't deem that important. But now, we are now settled on Vector Motors. And Jerry gets straight to business working on a brand new supercar dubbed the WX8. WX8 powered by a supercharged 10 liter all aluminum V8 capable of 1,850 horsepower. That kind of horsepower would have made it faster than any of the Bugattis, Ferraris, or Lamborghinis of that time. So it's the mid 2000s, 2006, 2007, 2008, whatever, you know, around that time frame. And Jerry is making his rounds with the WX8 at all the important car shows. And then there's just kind of a little bit of a lapse in the timeline for about 10 years until 2018. Well, in 2018, Jerry would put up those two WX3 prototypes, the coupe and the roadster, an amethyst and a turquoise, on the DuPont registry to sell as a pair for $3.5 million. He wanted to sell them in order to bankroll the WX8. Naturally, Jerry put a buyback provision on the sale of these WX3s. Buyback said, let us buy back our WX3 prototypes in exchange for like double what you paid or double what you paid in exchange for Vector Motors stock offerings. So. I couldn't tell. I didn't see, I couldn't track down any history that they actually sold on the DuPont registry. But one year later in 2019, they were sold by RM Sotheby's at the Arizona Car Week. The turquoise coupe went for $615,000 and the Amethyst Roadster went for $500,000. It doesn't seem like enough for the rareness of those cars. What do you think? Sadly, Jerry passed away in January of 2021. And so I believe the dream of the Vector supercar. But who knows? Maybe somebody will come along and purchase the name. I don't know who from. And the rebirth, the rising from the ashes will be Vector again. Don't forget that Bugatti, after a Tory died and, or after a Tory got older and he no longer has son, it John had passed away very early on in the 1939 uh, Type 57G Le Mans, aka the tank. Uh, Bugatti didn't have anybody to go to, and it kind of became stagnant until Roman Artioli bought it and did the EB110, and then, then he sold it. Who knows? Vector might come back. But right now, I don't think anything's happening with it because I tried out their website and it's not afloat. All right, guys. Well, I hope you enjoyed this quick and informal little tale about an American supercar dream. And if you like this kind of stuff, press subscribe. If not, that's fine too. I'm going to go have a beer now. Bye.